Nestled in New York's Central Park, this is the largest art museum in America. The Metropolitan Museum of Art is 2.3 million square feet of objects spanning 5,000 years of history. The museum really was an audacious vision to create a cultural center that rivaled the greatest in the world. The Met is a collection of collections. Paintings, jewelry, textiles, statuary, and the world's most famous fashion gala. Every year we're pumping out something pretty amazing. It's America's treasure house. The collection is what excites every curator to be part of this institution. In 2020, the Met turned 150 in its pomp and ready to celebrate. I'm this excited. But as the revels began, COVID-19 struck New York. There are new warnings about the coronavirus outbreak. For the first time ever, the Met was shut indefinitely. Then the deaths of African-Americans at the hands of white police officers shook America. Demands for social justice for all have the museum examining its past and its future. I could apologize all day long for JP Morgan and everybody else. What is meaningful is to put yourself on the line. The Met is an art museum, and every work of art carries a political message. Washington, you know, as an indigenous person, he's not one of my heroes. Time to address what's on the walls, what it's saying, to listen with humility. These objects were stolen. They were never intended to be in a space like the Met. In its 150th year, comes an existential crisis. The Met must change, or it will be history. It's an extraordinary political act of defiance. We're making new history now. It's July 2020. The Met has now been closed for five months by COVID-19. In May, the killing of George Floyd has citizens of all races across America marching in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. On July 22nd, New York police are clearing demonstrators from City Hall Park as curator Sheena Wagstaff visits the Met's Breuer Gallery. As head of the Modern and Contemporary Art Department, she's taking down a landmark exhibition almost nobody saw. I've actually never had the pleasure of doing that before, of being able to go right the way around it and just see the room reflected in it. It's extraordinary. Do you mind reiterating that one more time? That you no, I'm going to burst into tears in a second, actually. <laughs> um, I've never actually been in here without people being in the space, because the show was only open for nine days, and of course it was crowded after we opened. What a pleasure. What a tragedy. <laughs> anyway. 100 works by 88-year-old painter Gerhard Richter explore a subject that suddenly seems timely, racial intolerance and inhumanity. This painting is emblematic of Richter's early work. He is um, playing around with the notion of photorealism and the idea of reality. He is also inclining, some years later, into pure abstraction. He was a teenager at the point of the Second World War, and he had the maybe temerity or foolhardiness to address directly the legacy of Nazism in Germany. These paintings are based on four photographs taken by prisoners in um, the concentration camp Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, and their job was to um, take the bodies out of the ovens and dispose of them. These photographs stimulated Richter to try to take account of this event, this historic event, um, by painting it. Richter dared to go where others feared to tread. I think this show, and one of the reasons why I'm so um, sad about the fact that it's not reopening is because the atrocities um, that are reflected in this exhibition and the way that an artist has dealt with them, having an unflinching gaze on humankind's inhumanity to people um, has so many lessons to teach us. 
with the events of this last four months through the coronavirus, but you know, more recently and more relevantly in many respects too, that the protests against the lack of cultural, racial and economic justice in our world. It's a barometer really of our times, I think, this exhibition. And I'm just very sorry that people are not seeing it, you know. Lockdown will end. When that day comes, what will the Met's purpose be? There's one aspect of certainty. Our institutions become local institutions. We have never, except probably at the founding of the museum, thought about the necessity to be relevant, directly relevant to our local communities. So this is actually a pretty amazing moment for us, but we just have to get it right. And we have to work damn hard to get it right. Any discussion about the future of the museum really has to take account of this moment across not just the curatorial departments, but also in the communications department, in you know the director's office itself. Um, and not just things like recruitment, but a much more forensic investigation in how we conduct our daily business. I mean, it's huge. <laughs> A month later, and the Met is open. Safety is everything. Visitor numbers are restricted. There are no tourists, so the museum's back where it was in 1870, serving locals. People are looking for an outlet because everything has been shut down. Uh, knowing that they can come here safely is something that's really uh, sat well with New Yorkers. Oh my God, she loves it here. She makes it so much easier to not set anyone off. They don't expect the golden retriever, you know, to be a security type animal. It's a big day in the Samuel household in Connecticut. Tracy Ann is taking her daughters to the museum. Thank you. You're welcome. She and husband Cleon grew up in New York. The Met was their place. When we did live in New York, we went a lot. One of the best dates you ever took me on, it was on Valentine's Day. You took me to the Metropolitan Museum. We had a dinner at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. That was a really lovely date. We should do that again. We have two daughters, Kristen and Kelsey. They are four and 10. Correct. Kristen, she's the creative. She enjoys writing. Yes. She's created a book group with her friends. Zach. Zach, yeah. <laughs> her best friends, first letters in their names form the word Zach. They've been actively collaborating. At if first, you will. I thought it was a boy, so my, my eyebrow kind of. <laughs> the was, Zach book club. Who's Zach? <laughs> Kelsey is more of the adventurer. There's so much going on with uh, race in America. It is a struggle for our family. And right now, the struggle is finding balance. How much do we want to expose our girls to? Um, how much do we want them to be aware of? This area of Connecticut, it, it's quite diverse. However, we have to get comfortable knowing that we may enter a room and there may not be anyone else that looks like us. So that's why it's very important raising two young girls that they're confident in the skin that they're in and they're able to see themselves themselves reflected beautifully, whether it's in arts, um, in magazines, the TV, whatever it is. So we seek things out. And we're off. Okay. You have to know what you're looking for, but the Met does showcase power amongst people of color. The African exhibit, the Egyptian art, for my girls to see themselves reflected in history in such a powerful way, it's important. Tracy Ann is bound for a museum changed by the events of the summer. In June, a letter identifying racism at all New York arts institutions demanded immediate change. Many signatories were Met employees. One of the challenges for me, to be perfectly honest, has been trying to come to terms with and really understand the nature of the anger and the frustration that have surfaced in the light of this moment. Black Lives Matter and indigenous people and so many others who have been oppressed and that some of it was directed at the leadership of this museum. And I, I did not fully see that coming. In July, 
the executive team drew up the commitments, promising changes from recruitment to captioning, exhibitions to education, even the art. We designed a spreadsheet and I said to everyone, if we don't fill this out and complete it, then I should be replaced. I look at this on a regular basis. Assessing our history. A set of commitments to anti-racism cannot begin without an honest assessment of an institution's own history and present practices. The Met was born in an era when some collector's tools were a pickaxe and a sense of entitlement. The treasure of other cultures was sometimes acquired without respect or payment. Staff have expressed long-held anger. I sit in a seat that was occupied by many, many predecessors, going back to J.P. Morgan and others. And people are mad at them, and they're mad at the institution. So our job is to try to figure out how to, how to deal with that. And for me, that meant our commitments. I could apologize all day long for my predecessors, but that's an empty gesture. What is meaningful is to put yourself on the line to bring change that you think is needed. In its anniversary year, the Met has been deeply affected by a virus. But will the demands for social justice change the place forever? I think COVID and Black Lives Matter will be ultimately commingled as an era. But one of them is a disease we're trying to survive. The other is a society we're trying to build. And that should have more lasting importance. In the summer, controversial statues all over the country were attacked. At the Met, Dan promises organizational changes, but right now, the art is under scrutiny. How many works have the potential to offend? Augustus St. Gordon's 19th century sculpture, Hiawatha, is a Met favorite, but perhaps not with Native American visitors. We have an obligation to explain why these things are on view, particularly when images or objects might have a pejorative perspective on a culture or a people. In this environment, we're doing more labeling because we want people to learn, and we think that's a useful thing for us to be doing. That said, there is always the risk that someone might want to deface a work of art for any number of reasons. I think it's important to recognize that everybody's complicated. Everybody's complicated. George Washington is a good case in point. There is no question that without George Washington, this country would never have come into being. That is a historical fact. And he believed in democracy. He believed in what this country could be. On the other hand, he owned slaves. He thought himself a benevolent slave owner, but the record says otherwise. He was a product of the 18th century, and he was a farmer and a slave owner. And he thought that was his right. So the question then is, how do we reconcile these aspects of this individual? What should the historical record of him be? What should the Metropolitan do about his legacy? How should we display his art and how should we describe it? Reasonable people can disagree and let them. And through that kind of debate and discussion, we'll all learn something. The Met's commitments have gone public. Will visitors feel a difference? Only time will tell. You want to touch the dog? You have to ask first. No, sit down. The Samuel family arrives, and Kelsey deactivates the Met security system. <laughs> that was adorable. To stay in business, the museum must remain relevant to the next generation. Lead the way, Kelsey. Mommy wants to show you something. The Samuel girls are the future. The family will judge the Met by its exhibits. The first stop is The American Wing, art telling the national story. Kristen reads between the lines. It's George Washington. It looks like he's pointing just because after he saw all those pictures of people pointing, he decided he'd do it himself. He is holding onto the horse's rein. Washington stands on a bluff above the Hudson River with the William Lee. His enslaved valet, groom and military aide, but we'd make George Washington the center, him on the side. The painting is also one of the best known representations of Lee, depicted in turban based on a European Orientalist convention associated 
with black figures. An accurate visual portrait of Lee is unknown. Depictions of the general are better known. Emmanuel Lloyd says portrait of 1851, Washington crossing the Delaware, is an American icon. It idealizes events of Christmas night, 1776, an amphibious assault made by revolutionary forces on European occupiers in Trenton, New Jersey. Let's take a look at this picture together. What's one big thing that you see? The American flag. Mommy, there's ice and trees. Ice and trees, good job. George Washington did a brave thing with the soldiers. I think that's a girl. Uh, I think I see a girl. It's hard to tell sometimes. We're not sure that's a woman. So women are not represented in this picture, huh? Now, Washington, he's a leader. How is he different? He's wearing some sort of red cape. He's wearing a hat. He's wearing boots, a sword. So he's, he's armed. Now, do you think Washington is a strong leader in this picture? He's not doing anything. I wouldn't say he's not doing anything. He's not doing much. Are you sure about that? All he's doing is standing there, facing and saying, you're in the front, you're the person steering, there's land, let's head there. So he's a leader, yeah. but not in the sense of doing more in the sense of directing. Do you think that leaders in these situations can be women? Yes. Do you see this person? He doesn't even have a face. He just has a little sliver over there. You can see him. You can see the side of his face. I rarely come into this section because there really isn't much that I could relate to. You know, you see so many pictures of men winning. And I would like to see more of that, more representation of some women or um, people of color winning so that I can show my girls, hey, look, look. Or not even just to say, hey, look, look. It's just something that they see. Downstairs in the Great Hall, the iconic image of Washington crossing the Delaware has inspired a very different kind of history painting. In 2018, the Met commissioned two works from Native American artist Kent Monkman. When I was invited to do the project, I thought of New York as this portal for immigration. So Europeans basically flooding through New York into North America, ultimately displacing the first people of this continent. So I thought of arrivals and departures. And the Great Hall itself is a place of arrivals and departures. Monkman reinterprets classic paintings to suggest alternative stories. The Met collections were an inspiration. The paintings or sculptures made by the settler artists who were looking at indigenous people are always this romantic view of the vanishing race. In fact, we're very much alive. My work really is refuting those themes of disappearance. The paintings feature an alternative heroic figure, Miss Chief Eagle Testicle a gender-fluid persona the artist inhabits for public events. Looking at the Emmanuel Leutze painting, he's the hero of that painting. And I wanted Miss Cheap to be the hero of my two paintings. I wanted to make a monumental painting that really reflected on indigenous perspective to give it that same importance. Monkman is from the Cree First Nation, working in Toronto, Canada. Projects are frequently a celebration of non-binary sexuality that's part of Native American culture. We had people who lived in the opposite gender, people who were that full spectrum of LGBTQ, and they were misunderstood by the Europeans who arrived, and they thought they were uh, disgusting. This is a rather gruesome image um, based on a, a 15th century engraving um, by Teodoro de Bry, which shows the Spanish conquistadors throwing sodomites to the dogs. I'm not shy of making work that has political impact. Um, I have things that I want to say that speak about the experience of Indigenous people, both historical and, and in the present. And those are political experiences because we've been colonized and we continue to be colonized. Monkman's political message is delivered via his alter ego. So a lot of my paintings, Miss Chief is sort of central. She's the witness who is there 
uh, while these things are happening. Like Miss Chief is there when the newcomers arrive. She's also there, you know, when her people are displaced. There's a lot of humor in, in Cree culture and in our stories, but also, you know, as a strategy for just um, seducing people into my work, I use humor as a way to kind of disarm people. Because uh, I look at a lot of dark things. And of course, uh, Washington crossing the Delaware is this monumental celebration of an American hero. And Washington was a slave owner and he was uh, burning down indigenous villages. So, uh, you know, as an indigenous person, that's not, he's not one of my heroes. The museum's two paintings are entitled Misty Kozwak, or Wooden Boat People. The Met, in commissioning these works, they're saying we want to engage with diverse voices. We want to engage with indigenous voices. And it was an opportunity to uh, reflect on that colonial mindset that created these narratives in museums like the Met. Wow. The guy holding the feather looks like George Washington. In the Great Hall, the Samuels find Kent Monkman's epic painting speaks directly to them. Over here, you see people from different walks of life. I mean, that guy looks like daddy. Which guy looks like daddy? The guy in the white coat. Doesn't he kind of look like daddy? Yeah. He looks like he's a doctor, because he's wearing a necklace that has... A doctor sign on it? The symbol for healthcare, oh, yeah. Oh, OK. This is interesting. I noticed oh. something. What did you notice? I feel like this happened before that happened. Okay because the dude does not have the feather in his hand, and the guy that looked like he was the doctor is in the water first. And look what's on his hands. Yes, it looks like he broke away from slavery. Yeah. And then he became a doctor, and then they set out on a ship to find land and helping and to help other people that are sinking. Kristen. Yes. Good job. Leading the Mets Diversity Drive, Director Max Holline put the pictures right at the front door. Policeman is, of course, part of this. They are not somewhere in gallery 117, to the left and then to the right and then to the middle. They have to be strong positions. It's on one hand a huge opportunity, but it's a challenge. It's a challenge for the artist. So you, you push artists to, to really respond to that. And there are certain artists who respond to it well, and I think that's the case certainly for Kent, and then others who might feel uncomfortable with that level of permanent exposure. But it's also a very charged environment. It's not just a white wall. So you have to make sure that the work can really stand its ground. Art and politics are inseparable. Conservator Dorothy Mahon works on a politically charged portrait painted just before the French Revolution of 1789. I'm cleaning this picture finally. It was in the collection for 40 years and never been in conservation. The painting was painted in 1788. They were a power couple. Even having a portrait made in this size uh, was a statement. Jacques-Louis David's painting shows scientists Mr. and Mrs. Lavoisier to be all work and no play. That's not the way the portrait began. The first conception of the picture was a well-to-do couple in stylish 18th century mode. They started out in much more fancy dress. She had a gigantic high-style hat. Originally, he was sitting at a very fancy French 18th century desk. But David was an incredibly good painter. The final finish doesn't really display any of those tremendous changes. When the uprising began, this work flaunting wealth and privilege was suddenly dangerous, as X-rays reveal. All the years that this picture was looked at and, and studied, no one ever suspected, until it came up to the studio where we really got a close look at it, that all these changes were made. This is a map that shows the distribution of the lead. The red paint that you see there is actually red. Red and black in the 1780s is incredibly fashionable from Marie Antoinette right on down. And what's great is the specificity of that particular hat, which can actually be pinpointed within a few months of being at the height of fashion, really uh, specific in its, uh, in its moment. Not really the timeless image that we think of with the end result. You see the table was fully painted. You see that the leg was shifted. We really had so many discoveries. You go from a really kind of high fashion, mundane image to one that's 
science reason. We don't know what point these changes happened. We know that the royal authorities were advising Lavoisier and David not to show this portrait. Presumably, there's a discussion that happens quite late on where they decide, no, let's rethink the entire thing. It does really give us a closer glimpse at the time. Well, and Monsieur Lavoisier is beheaded shortly after this is painted. But this shows you how quickly the political terrain is evolving um, and people uncertain how to even address it. Are we good? It's really so beautiful. Okay. You gotta go up just like that. Yeah, yeah. Just keep it close to the wall, right? Ready? One, two, three. 226 years after Antoine Lavoisier lost his head, the eight-foot-tall painting is hung in the newly renovated European Paintings Gallery. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's crooked, but at least it's hanging. Um, yeah. so the right side needs to come down about three inches, but that's... A caption will relate the couple's downfall, but the Met is full of the stories of the rich, white, and dead. The selection of exhibits and their location, even the framing and lighting, are all decisions with political dimensions, currently prompting debate within the museum. Up. More, quite a bit. Department head Keith Christensen is retiring after 44 years at the Met. I'm leaving at the right stage. There needs to be a younger generation who now moves in, more keenly aware of the museum's shifting relationship with society. I don't think I'm, I would be the right person to do that. Good, thank you all. I hope that as the present and the past become further and further detached, it's always the primary mission of the museum to try and preserve the particular voice of the individual works of art, rather than to make them speak what we want them to say. For some curators, excellence is enough. Beauty an end in itself. Concerned for the spiritual welfare of their booming city, the Met's philanthropist founders believed that by getting close to beautiful objects, the lives of New York's workers would be improved. One of their earliest decrees was that artists should be allowed to come in with their sketchbooks and be inspired. A favorite subject is a 19th century copy of Perseus with the head of Medusa by Antonio Canova. The 17th century original was carved for the Vatican. Sheena Wagstaff is a modernist. She'd like the Met experience to say something new. So you come into the Great Hall and you're confronted immediately with this beautiful Athena um, on the left, which heralds the beginning of the Greek and Roman galleries, and then on the right, a pharaoh that heralds the Egyptian galleries. And then right at the top of the stairs, you can see this huge tiepolo. It is European civilization that sits at the top. What would it be if one changed that idea? There are other stories to tell. The Met is already on its way to tell those stories, but we could be a little bit more radical, perhaps. The modern and contemporary galleries are a destination for visitors. But post-war, the popularity of modern art was not reflected at the Met. When, in the late 60s, abstract art was finally admitted, it was mainly American works by white men. Today, Wagstaff's galleries are full of diverse narratives. Here, African-American artists have a voice. Kerry James Marshall's celebration of the visit to the studio of his hero, Charles White. Sam Gilliam's drape painting, commenting on the state of affairs in 1968. An homage to Hard Scrabble Harlem by Faith Ringgold. Sheena has just bought another. This is a piece by Rashid Johnson, and it's called Five Broken Men, representing a more generalized version of what it means to be a black man in a society that is still inherently racist. These are not political paintings per se, 
but they have a political undercurrent. There is, I think, a new state of urgency that museums particularly need to respond to, the Met being one of the biggest ones, a response to the political urgencies of this time. The museum is committed to increasing the diversity of art and artists, but that will be a slow process. What I'm trying to get is that opening shot, finding the performer, framing the performer. It can be much more nimble through its program of live arts events. Let's try this way. Li Ming Wei is a Taiwanese American artist whose medium is performance. He's come to the Met and a collaboration with dance master Bill T. Jones with his touring work, Our Labyrinth. The idea arrived when I was visiting some of the sacred sites and temple in Myanmar. I saw all those people cleaning the path to the temple. 24 hours a day, it's a gift for the temple. It's a gift for the people who visit the temple. So the next day I went and just did the cleaning and the idea came to me that I would love to do this in a museum because museum for me is a spirit house. Okay, so what I'm suggesting is glide along the wall and find her. Ming Wei is a, quite a masterful artist and he has done a version of this in many, many locations. And I was asking what makes it uh, different in New York City? My inflection has demanded that the uh, people in it are as diverse as possible. I realize it's all about what is it to be a black, be an Asian, be a Latino, be a white, living in a cosmopolitan city such as New York. The work is a meditation on kindness. We're at this moment of Black Lives Matters, and I would Bill bring this work to a relatively Victorian idea of what a museum could be. I have my fights with the 19th century. Well, God, I don't know. I don't see any Confederate monuments here. But uh, I can imagine the politics of some of the people who made some of these things here. Not my concern. History, we're making new history now. The dance is filmed for broadcast on the Met's own digital channel. Culture is almost like a giant ocean liner. You don't turn on a dime. We find a time where the museum had to retreat, and now it's trying to come back and wants to come back with what face? For much of the museum's 150 years, the American Wing Galleries have displayed homegrown art telling familiar stories to a largely white audience. So it was a very limited and biased account of what constituted American art. We're very cognizant of, the, of what has been left out of that story. Certainly women artists, artists of color, Native American artists, and Latin American artists. For the longest time, this gallery had the largest number of works representing African American figures, but no works by African American artists. So that was something when I arrived I really wanted to address head on. This work by an enslaved artisan named David Drake from South Carolina dates to the 1850s. He was also signing them and penning verse to go on them. This is at a time that it was against the law for enslaved individuals to actually be literate in South Carolina. It's an extraordinary political act of defiance. The moment we're in right now is so deeply embedded in the past. America was founded you know, on genocide and enslavement. That is something we can't forget because it explains so much about where we are today. Particularly now, the issues we're dealing with with racial justice, income inequality, it all has its roots in our histories. The Ames vase here, the Indian vase. It is an extraordinary feat of carving. No question is a work of art in and of itself, but it's deeply problematic. Now, we've started a new project called the Native Perspectives Approach, and we're actually inviting Native scholars, Native artists, to respond to these rather problematic depictions. Bringing in that additional perspective has been really revealing, I think, for our visitors. We're not doing our job well if we're not telling their stories. In 2017, the American Wing expanded its Native American collection. 
a bequest of 91 items of indigenous art came with a condition. They must be displayed with other American arts. Today, Sylvia Yount gets a guided tour from a new and exceptional colleague. Patricia Maraquin Norby is the first ever Native American curator in Met history. What I find most striking about this is the very fine craftsmanship oh, of this moose antler. This was significant to the person who was using it. And so not as a ceremonial object? Well, our ceremonial items are actually used. Right. They still embody great meaning. Native and indigenous peoples are incredibly diverse, but environmental issues, systematic racism, violence, these are all issues that Native and Indigenous people have been dealing with for a very long time. For Indigenous people, these problems never ended. You know, each of us have our own origin stories, our own histories, um, our own relationships to our homelands, and so our art reflects all of these important elements. Each have their own experiences with museums. There's no one set way to work with each community other than to be respectful of their ways. No running, no running, no running. Kristen and Kelsey have reached the Egyptian galleries. They are finding kinship in deep antiquity. We were talking about the figures and how they were painted and how they look like us. The colors used for their skins, the reddish browns, the raven black hair. It's such a predominant representation of strength, beauty, power. It's just fascinating to me. I was born in Jamaica, West Indies, and I came to America when I was eight years old. My parents gave up everything for a better opportunity. And Sorry. I started to find out what my ancestry was. And I realized that, I'm sorry, it was hard to do because our ancestry is non-existent. This genealogist that was trying to help me shared references, websites in which you can track your ancestors who uh, came to the islands through the ships. And all you see is just like, Negro, 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 no names. There's no way to track. So this is where I come. I know that I have African history. Um, and what has been taught to myself and my children has been that of slavery. And there's more. There is more. Before that, what was it? Gallery 131 offers one answer. The Temple of Dendur was built by Romans in awe of North African gods and architectural splendor. What do you see? <gasps> the structure came to New York in 1968 when the building of Egypt's Aswan Dam threatened destruction. It took a decade to reconstruct it in its own gallery. We come from such rich heritage. There's engineering, there's mathematics, there's science, where we've been trailblazers. And I, in my late 30s, I'm just now learning about this. I wanted to give my girls a head start to learn about these things, to realize that we are so much more than the negative images on the screens. We're descendants of kings and queens. The Met wants this affirmative experience for all and has around two million objects to tell their stories with. The museum also lends and borrows on an international scale. The Sahel exhibition celebrates five Saharan empires that for over 1,300 years produced great art. Artisans working for gold-rich monarchs in what is now one of the poorest regions in Africa produced masterworks in wood, precious metal, and clay. Many of the 200 exhibits are loaned by African museums. This finely wrought solid gold pectoral is from a 13th century burial mound in northern Senegal. Visitors enter past another Senegalese treasure, 
a megalith carved around the 9th century to stand in one of 93 stone circles along the banks of the Gambia River. Today, the exhibition is being taken down. The smaller objects are gone. Time to send the massive stone back to the Met's partner museum in Dakar. Morning, guys. The head of the Met's in-house heavy lifting team is Creighton Sohan. <laughs> Nothing big moves in the museum without his nod. So we're gonna put that strap right here. It's two and a half tons, it's pretty heavy. With this kind of work, there's no trial and error, because everything we touch, it's millions and millions of dollars. Conservator Carolyn Riccadelli regularly moves large exhibits around the world. I've built up a tolerance, so I don't get nervous, but it's hard for a lot of people to watch. This bottom, we pull this way, so we tip it over in the air and we get them flat. Come down together. We gotta be even. You grew up with the saying that everybody has a talent. Uh, hold it. We gotta straighten it up a little bit and move them down this way. There you go. We got into this department and things started to come naturally. That's good. It, it turns out that this, I, apparently, was my talent. I got the opportunity here. I loved it here. I worked with some great people. I guess people saw what I can do, and I got the breaks. I took it, and I got encouragement along the way. And here I am, 36 years plus later. <laughs> Where you came from, or your color, or your religion, has nothing to do with what you can do. You have it or you don't with this kind of work. The Met began during America's Industrial Revolution. European arts were afforded respect. The rest was of little interest. For decades, objects from black and brown cultures were ethnography, not art. These are all exquisite. Growing up, Mary Rockefeller heard them called primitive. That was the prevailing word then, mainly because people didn't respect and understand this indigenous art. In the 1960s, her father, Nelson Rockefeller, a collector of this overlooked art, offered the Met his entire collection. The museum was not interested, and they encouraged father to give his collection to the Museum of Natural History. And of course, he wasn't interested in the Museum of Natural History at all. He was interested in, in the recognition of the excellence of this art. In 1980, Rockefeller finally won. The new wing for the arts of Africa, Oceania and the Americas was dedicated to Mary's twin, Michael. As a boy, he'd been obsessed. Michael and father developed this incredible bond over this art. And Michael wanted to get out of his environment of how he'd been brought up. They decided that New Guinea was the place for him to go because they wanted to collect art from the Asmat peoples. In 1961, Michael Rockefeller disappeared. Some said he'd drowned, others that he'd been eaten by cannibals. I went to look for my brother. It was a sad, terrible experience for me, but I was lucky enough to go to New Guinea, and it made me understand some of what Michael must have experienced, why he was so drawn. And that art deals with the kind of issues that anybody in the world are dealing with. Issues of safety, power, life and death. They were right out front with those things. There's all kinds of motifs that have enormous meaning. They're all metaphors. See all these motifs here? Some of them are the praying mantis. The female bites off the head of the male. And of course, it's all related to the ceremony of headhunting. You can go into all the horrible places about it all, or you can step back and try to see it in a larger context of what they were doing. And when you look at the culture of the Asmat, 
and you look at the amount of people that were killed in that culture, it is so minuscule compared to our culture. I hardly ever get to talk about this stuff. I mean, I just remember having these discussions with, you know, and, and, and trying to, to see it from Michael's perspective and why he was so excited about these people and why he loved that area so much. The Rockefeller Wing was born out of Michael's devotion, but still poses the big question, shouldn't it all be given back? I think that a lot has to do with respect. I mean, if objects are stolen or that it's clear objects were taken from a country, not sold, but taken, they should be returned. I think it's very difficult to go back in history. Sometimes it's not clear, but it's a challenging question. I don't feel I have all the answers. It's a question to which Puerto Rican artist Miguel Luciano has an answer. He's a frequent visitor to a Rockefeller collection of pre-Columbian Caribbean arts. This sculpture has particular resonance, once used in community ritual. Luciano is part of a new Met project using art to build links between the museum and its neighbor communities. It's a really special object. It was probably used in ceremonies using this kind of hallucinogenic plant medicine. It's similar, I think, to ayahuasca. It's probably from Haiti or the Dominican Republic, the island of Hispaniola. If, if it weren't for the museum, I would never have access to this thing. I'm grateful that it's here, but I'm also very conflicted by my experience of my own history and heritage that's limited by the museum and its kind of institutional framework um, that has always been a very colonial framework. And the acquisition history of so many of the objects that we find in museums in general share these kinds of colonial legacies. But it's not so simple as just returning them to where they came from, perhaps. Obviously, the objects, they're protected for preservation but it prevents us from understanding them the way they were originally intended for us to understand them. And so how do we reimagine them in the spaces of our own community, as opposed to this very sort of like depersonalized, sterile form of engagement? The fragile figure wouldn't survive being handled. So Miguel has cloned it. This nice candy kind of gloss is what I'm looking for. Working with the Met's digital imaging team, Luciano has modeled the figure using a 3D printer. Today, he's come to a Manhattan plastics company to work on it. This object is a Taino Semi Cojoba stand. The top of the obviously the object used as a pedestal to grind cojoba from. Mm -hmm. It would have been used to have visions, right, by the community leader, like a shaman. The imagery of the figure has such an intensity. The ribs on the back show you that this, this character is kind of emaciated, yeah. probably fasting before the ceremony. But this is what I love about it, is that his eyes, you see those grooves? And so these were tears carved in, his teeth are gritting. So that kind of intensity of crying and gritting uh, and grimacing yeah. um, uh, it might have been part of the physical experience of taking cojoba. Mm. And so these may have been used in ceremonies throughout the Caribbean, so, you know. There's still like hieroglyphics on like rocks. You pass by it all the time. This is what is exciting to me about this object. The whole purpose of making this is so that people who actually share in the history and heritage of this object can understand it in an up close and personal way. These are ancestral objects that have been taken away from us, from their ancestral lands. Ultimately, these were stolen. They were never intended to be in a space like the Met. It is time for museums to, I think, be reconsidering their own colonial past as they think about how to be more relevant.
in the present and in the future. Miguel's neighborhood was once known to New Yorkers as Spanish Harlem. Today's community keep a bond with their Spanish-speaking cultures with their own name, El Barrio. Nearly 7% of Manhattan's population hails from Puerto Rico. Public art is on every corner. Luciano is turning the Met's ancient carving back into art for the public. And at his studio, unveiling it for an important visitor, his mentor, the photographer, Hiram Maristani. I'm a little older than Miguel. I'm a little couple, old. Couple six, years. Six months older than Miguel. Six months. <laughs> In 1968, the community formed the Young Lords Civil Rights Protest Movement. Hiram was their photographer. Today, his images still adorn the area. In 1973, they featured in a Met show, The Art and Heritage of Puerto Rico. Miguel is following in Hiram's footsteps. To this day, it's the largest survey of Puerto Rican art that's existed in any major museum. I think it would be fair and just to give credit to some of the people at the Met. They took risk. It was a mind shift. Absolutely. I was one year old when the show happens, right? So I was born in 72. So I was three years old. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'm saying, like, the generation in front of me, right, it's an incredibly influential show for a, an entire generation. So this is what I'm doing with the Met right now. We actually went to see Arte del Mar a couple weeks ago. The premier object in the show is the semi cojoba stand. This is a replica. The semi in blue. Amazing. This still needs a lot of polishing and stuff. Mm -hmm. The idea is to actually create a, uh, a venue in El Barrio so we can actually introduce this to exactly. the community in a way where people can have uninterrupted access to it. It's a great piece, man. Thanks. I really love it. I, really I mean, love it's in it, process. Yeah, yeah so. no, no. This is a prime example of what a, a really good art project should be. You know, at the end of the day, we come from a colonized reality. And a lot of our history was denied us. Mm -hmm. And in that denial, we lost the ability to appreciate some of the indigenous elements of our culture. What you just described, access to our own history, yeah. is really what drives this whole project. These were ceremonial objects. These were... These um, were religious objects. They were, exactly. I've been thinking a lot about these ancestral connections. You know, even if we're reimagining them um, through this kind of, you know, this blue uh, resin artifice. It's like, it's embedded in there somewhere, you know? Miguel's Met project will now expand into the community. Regenerated, the thousand-year-old figure will again, he hopes, promote unity and identity. The largest art museum in the Americas has a responsibility to empower by making visible the stories of every citizen of a country defined by immigration. The Met is led by a white man who grew up seeing the trauma of the civil rights movement. Now, seeing the racism inherent in his own institution has left him dismayed. These issues affected the daily lives of so many people that I considered friends and colleagues and I didn't know anything about. And that's, I think, ultimately what privilege is. The ability, the luxury to say one thing, believe that you believe it, but not really know. And we know that we have failed in many ways. We have not always been an institution that is welcoming to everyone, public or staff. What we can do is make sure that this museum is really here for everybody. How many eyes do you see? Tracy Ann and her girls are coming to the end of their visit. In Africa, they say that they honored cows. They called cows. A god with a wet nose. A god with a wet nose? A god with a wet nose. I'm hoping that by seeing more images that are reflective of diversity, my girls can find a place for themselves within those images and find beauty and find success. It's interesting to see how historical figures were portrayed there's a message that they're sending, a message of authority, power. You look at an image, but you don't have an, a full understanding of the backstory or the conflict that surrounds that particular image. One picture 
has dominated their day. It's really important if we're going to present images of George Washington that we don't just take them at face value. I mean, this is one of the most heroicized depictions in the history of all art. So to draw attention to that fact, currently on view, there are wonderful responses to this picture. Jacob Lawrence, the American struggle. There's a great painting by Jacob Lawrence, actually, of the leading African-American artist of the 20th century. Then Lawrence is telling Washington is absent. He's eschewed the great man narrative entirely to focus on the anonymous soldiers who obviously were responsible for the success of this endeavor. This exhibition is a highlight of director Max Holine's diversity drive. In 1954, Lawrence began this series of paintings, chronicling America's birth pangs and honoring the contribution of the black population. His interpretation of Washington crossing the Delaware immediately attracts Kristen's attention. Mommy, I saw this picture on something that we saw. Yeah, this is a picture of George Washington. There's some obvious differences here, Kristen. What do you think about this piece? Is there a leader here? I don't. There's no leader. When the museum reopened, New Yorkers flocked to a show that dealt head on with the African American legacy of injustice. Oh, look at these, Kristen. Mm. Wow. In this harrowing scene, blood red streaks punctuating a vertical mass of chained and armed black and white figures convey in visceral terms the powerful desire to live free. It's not uh, a large exhibition with regard to like checklist, but it's immense from a symbolic institutional standpoint. This exhibition has been uh, planned for, for years, but it accrued timeliness in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And then I think it accrued additional meaning as we've all endured our own struggles under COVID and social distancing. So there's a great sense of a kind of communal experience in this space, I think. Jacob Lawrence's narrative has to do with the necessity of struggle to achieve and maintain a democracy. Jacob Lawrence, he's arguably the most important uh, black American artist of the 20th century. But regardless of his race, just he's fundamentally one of the greats. Born in New Jersey in 1917, Lawrence was influenced by Cubism and inspired by Harlem. For this project, he planned 60 panels, but only made 30. Several have been lost, but now, magically, one has been found, property of some very surprised pensioners. They bought it out of a charity art auction for a children's music school in 1960 uh, for $50. And it's been sitting quietly in their Upper West Side apartment uh, ever since. It's the feel-good story of the season, and I think there's just such an appetite for good news. This is my first time going to an exhibit in which a African-American uh, is celebrated on such a large scale. Though the theme itself may not be the most um, beautiful, in the end, there's triumph. There is this thirst for freedom at any cost. And that should be celebrated. I can't wait to see what the next 50 years will look like. Even if I need a wheelchair, she'll take me to the Met because she knows just how important this place is to me. Next time, the museum has a cash crisis and many mouths to feed. I'm glad I'm not in that position to juggle long-term mission with what we're doing in a real crisis right now how to fund the shows. It's a massive undertaking. Broadway theater is probably the closest to this level of production. The research and development. The color palette has been a sort of shock to everyone. This is unique. I have to do in a very good way. And the new roof. And they come to you for the money for this. And I've got to find the money to do it. The Met was built on philanthropy, but in these troubled times, does it still exist? It really exposes the American model of funding of cultural institutions. What's going to happen now?